everyone. How are we doing today? Firstly, um, thank you so much to Adobe and to the Make It team for having me here. It's really great to be back in Sydney. I actually started my career here, so it's really good to be back speaking to you, the creative community, about myself and uh, my work. So for those that don't know me or my work, my name's Kit. I'm a prop maker, a stylist, and an artist, and I'm currently living and working in Melbourne. So my work really centers primarily around using handmade and craft-based techniques to create all sorts of different creative outcomes, whether that be constructing an object for a shoot, designing a set or a window installation, teaching a creative workshop, or producing content for online publications. But before I get too far into that, I just wanted to share uh, a little highlights reel of my life to let you know kind of where I've come from and how I got to be where I am today. So let's start at the beginning, 1983, probably the most crucial moment in my career to date, being born. Um, so here's a picture of me uh, probably producing um, my first ever masterpiece. Um, I guess it's just a sign of what was to come. Fast forwarding a little bit to 1989, my first official job in the creative industry, a short stint as a child model. So here's me on the catwalk modeling, I guess what's like the equivalent of activewear, um, but in the 80s. Personally, I prefer this type of activewear to activewear today, but that's just me. Now, speeding forward a couple of years, 1997, so I was living in the United Arab Emirates with my family, and I was attending an American international school. Um, this period was really a time where I figured out how much I loved to be creative. So me and my best friend Kelly had this full-blown business where we would create all of this super 90s stuff like friendship bracelet, bead necklaces, um, painted light bulbs, uh, we used to do hair wraps on people, um, and we used to do all of this at our school fates, and we were very entrepreneurial, we made a killing, and we just spend all our money on like glitter, lip gloss, and Blink-182 merchandise. <laughs> so anyway, a bit of an awkward phase for me here, 1999, so I've discovered punk music and the punk scene, and with that has come this full-blown rebellion. So I basically hate everything, I hate everyone. I don't want to do anything that anyone tells me to do, I don't want to be normal, I don't want to focus on my studies, all I want to do is make mixtapes, chain myself to stuff in protest of like nothing really in particular, and deconstruct all my clothing and then put it all back together again using safety pins. And then shit escalates a little, little bit, and it's 2001, and I've become a full-blown goth. <laughs> Much to the dismay of my parents, I can imagine. So all I do all day is hide in my room. I do these like really intricate spells with like magic books and like crystals and feathers, and I listen to death metal like really loud for hours, like the same song for hours. Uh, I make these kind of intense, like verging on stalker voodoo dolls of all these girls that used to bully me at school. And I basically just feel really sorry for myself, but I also feel really physically hot because I'm still living in the Emirates and it's like 40 degrees outside and I'm still insisting on wearing like 17 layers of black clothing every day. Um, so I look back on this stage and I wonder if the reason why my life and work is super colorful now is because I literally spent three whole years of my life wearing only black and thinking only black thoughts. So anyway, 2003, the art school years, as I like to call them, so um, I'm back in Australia, I'm at art school. I don't really learn anything from art school at all, but I do learn a lot about myself. Um, and I also learn a lot about costume making because I'm consistently just making handmade stuff for me and my classmates to wear around campus. And so I'm talking like not just art school campus, but like the wider university. So I'm kind of a freak. So then after uni, I moved to Sydney and I just literally throw myself at whatever creative opportunity comes my way. So I started my own fashion and accessories label, which I sold at design markets and on Etsy. The highlight of which was finding out that a young Katy Perry had bought a whole bunch of stuff from my Etsy store. Here's a picture of her um, wearing something that I made. But rather than just let that go as like a real cool achievement, I decided to be completely uncool and email stalk her and basically try to beg her for me to be her like personal jewelry maker. But suffice to say, she did not respond. Uh, but it was a pretty cool moment anyway. Also, for a period of time, I was pretty convinced that I was going to be a famous rapper. So I started an all-girl rap group with some friends of mine, and uh, we just had heaps of fun just like performing these raps about being cute in the club. Uh, we made our own costumes, we styled our own photo shoots, but unfortunately and tragically, um, we broke up. 
So before we could really like make it big. Anyway, fast forward to now. Making handcrafted stuff is my job. So basically I got here because I was assisting a stylist and she used to get me to make these handmade props and set pieces for her shoots. And one day she was like, you know what? Maybe you could do this for other people in the industry. And that was a really huge light bulb moment for me. I just thought, I've just consistently been making craft stuff on the side this whole time. And you know, I've developed this style and this aesthetic and I've built up all these skills. Maybe I can actually do something like this. So I've basically spent the last seven years or so actively pursuing this career path. And I've just sort of built it up bit by bit, put myself out there, said yes to heaps of different opportunities. And this is kind of where I'm at today. So why handmade? I've had a lot of time writing this talk to think about what the motivation is behind what I do. So I just wanted to share some thoughts with you now. So it can be really hard to keep up with how fast technology is moving these days. So you're now able to create absolutely anything, as we've seen today um, in the other presentations, with a computer. Sometimes you can even make stuff look handmade without it actually being handmade. And you know, things that once might have taken days, months, or even years can now be created in a very, very short amount of time. I find this absolutely fascinating and awe-inspiring. It's just like wonderful to me. But you know what? There's something like really, really special about the real thing for me. So hand skills go back thousands and thousands of years. My ancestors, the ancient Greeks, spent 50 years building the Acropolis. That's like thousands and thousands of laborers, skilled craftspeople, metal workers, slaving away for 50 whole years to build this thing that's still standing today, 2,500 years later. I mean, that is like next level. Can you imagine what it would feel to have that be your job for 50 years? I kind of think that maybe it felt something like this. So, also, Michelangelo, here he is, took four years to paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Imagine the literal neck ache that that would have been to just be like looking up, hand painting this thing for four whole years. And then there's my work. So I'm not sure what Michelangelo would think of this, but the point is that these masters of handmade pass their skills down generation after generation, and these skills have been used for thousands of years to create these like amazing things for us to use and enjoy. So to see these things fade out because technology is advancing so quickly is really sad to me, and it kind of feels like an extinction in a way. So I guess that's why I feel it's really important to try and maintain handmade techniques and methods in my work. So I feel like in doing this, I'm honoring these makers of the past by producing contemporary work that has a place in our modern world. But despite all this, I really don't discount the relevance that te technology plays in my work. In fact, um, it's very, very essential to what I do. But I like to use it as a complement to my work, so something that facilitates new ways of communicating my handmade aesthetic. So for me, that could mean things like template creation or sample production, manufacturing of components that I can then use to hand make things. Also, taking my work to new levels and allowing something one-off and handmade to be shared and distributed more widely, for example, as a printed image. So what exactly do I do? I guess I would call it craft-based design. Now, I came up with this term because I'm really, really bad at small talk, like in networking situations. So I get really, really nervous, and I get a bit flustered, and I just can't explain when someone asks me, what do you do, what it is that I do? Because it's quite varied, it's quite unusual. I mean, one time I was at this thing and I was talking to this guy who was like head of this really, really big agency that I was hoping to work for, and he asked me what I did and I got so flustered that I said I was the caterer. <laughs> I just don't know what came over me, so after that embarrassing thing happened, I decided, okay, I've got to come up with some kind of term to describe myself, and so craft-based design was the term. Anyway, my goal as a designer is to create work that's handmade and crafty and has all the qualities of a tactile object but can also sit comfortably within the design world. So in particular, I'm really interested in creating ways to incorporate craft into the commercial design world. So I really like the juxtaposition of seeing a handmade object in an unconventional setting. I find it interesting to combine this crafted object with slick photography and styling to tell a story. I feel like just by its handmade nature alone, it adds a really quirky, whimsical quality to a project. And I'm interested in using craft techniques and materials in really different and unique ways, like here as a collage medium, 
or to create type, for example. So throughout my work, whether I'm doing something more traditionally crafty or using technology to assist me to make something, there always has to be this handmade element running through it. For example, I'm really bad at drawing, so I get really intimidated every time someone says, draw something with a pen or a pencil. I just feel like a freak, and all I can do is draw stick figures. However, I guess because of my crafty background, I can confidently hand cut any shape ever with a pair of scissors without having to draw it first. So I do this thing that I like to call drawing with scissors. So every time I'm asked to do something that has like a graphic or illustrative outcome, I will hand cut stuff with scissors, scan it into a computer, and digitize it to produce um, that project. This is kind of my way of exploring graphic design and illustration using tools and methods that are more familiar and comfortable for me. I also use this technique to create shapes that could then get turned into uh, print-ready designs for creating stuff like laser-cut accessories, for example. So, yeah, this is kind of a roundabout way of going about designing something, but to me it just allows me to be um, super hands-on, super hands -on, like, no matter what I'm doing. So, as I mentioned before, punk music and culture really influenced me growing up. And um, it also influenced who I am today as a creative person. So I was really into the DIY ethos of the punk scene. So like making zines, printing your own posters for gigs, creating your own mixtapes, distributing your own music, making your own merch. So as a teen, I had pretty limited access to culture growing up in the Emirates. So me and my friends just had to create our own culture. So we would spend hours trawling through these like obscure chat rooms on the internet to find new music. We'd make our own clothes and wear them to school. Um, you know, I moved to England by myself after high school and uh, all of a sudden this punk scene was all around me and it was just fascinating and really, really inspiring. So I guess like I've just kept that DIY ethos throughout everything I do since that time. So I'm not only DIY in the way that I make things and the techniques I use, but I'm also DIY in the approach to my career. So I didn't really have a formal craft training and I didn't really have any guidance about how to be a craft-based designer because it wasn't really a thing. I just kind of like sort of made it up. Um, so I think I'd say that my career has been pretty self-made. So in this age, we can create our own career path. Social media makes it really, really easy for people to be self-made. You can make your own website. You can grow your own brand easily. You can network with people all around the world. You can reach out. You can self-educate. It's actually just so amazing, and it's very, very empowering to me. And I don't know about you guys, but empowerment is super addictive. So I guess I just keep with this DIY approach to everything because it makes me feel really good about myself. So it's crucial that I maintain a connection to Handmade um, and the Handmade culture and that I uphold this DIY ethos when it comes to making and thinking about my work. So this means engaging in things that take me out of the commercial design world and into other realms, for example, exhibiting as an artist. So this process of um, creating work for an exhibition allows me to really slow down and explore a particular theme or technique and spend time really delving into this, experimenting and producing this full body of work which I wouldn't usually get to do with a client, for example. I can also connect to the handmade culture by being part of the handmade marketplace, so designing and making my own products to sell. This allows me to regularly engage with other people in the handmade world um, through things like design markets. Crafting as a community is also a really important part of handmade culture, so to get together as a group and create stuff together. And this kind of making, this community making, has been happening um, all over the world in different cultures for many, many years. And for me, um, I want to uphold that tradition of skill sharing and passing on knowledge of handmade techniques. And so I do that through teaching creative workshops. And then as a natural follow-on to this, um, I write DIY content for different online and print-based publications. So I actually learned a lot of what I know from, about craft from things like forums and message boards and reading books and um, having little craft clubs with my friends. So creating DIY content allows me to share my skills with a really, really wide global audience. I also love working on personal projects that allow me to really explore making in its many forms and push the boundaries of craft in all sorts of different ways. It's really liberating to have no brief, um, to have no expectations, and really just start making and see what comes out. Also, personal projects allow me to be a little silly, and I don't know if you guys have noticed this about me, but I'm quite a silly person, and I love like ridiculous things, so having, being able to just make freely without you know, like having to be a professional in front of my clients is really, really good and just allows me to kind of keep that pie going. So 
So as I mentioned earlier in my talk, I've known since I was quite young that I really needed to pursue something creative for a living, and that the things that I was passionate about didn't really fall into a conventional idea of what a career should be. So as it stands now, I can't really see myself doing anything else other than this or a version of this. So I guess that means that my constant challenge is to take my dream of doing craft as a job for life and create some practical and real avenues in which to um, channel that passion. And so a lot of that involves actually educating um, potential clients and collaborators about what I do and illustrating to them the ways in which incorporating a handmade element into their project can really add value. So the key to me for this is diversification, so applying my skills in different ways to create this multifaceted practice that's based in handmade, but still is really eclectic and varied with many different things to offer a client. So as I mentioned before, that whole drawing with scissors thing, it allows me to work on more graphic and illustrative projects while still basing the style in a handmade context. And working a lot more um, on jobs at the moment that fall into that kind of like social media content creation realm. So using craft-based techniques to create really engaging visual experiences as part of digital campaigns. I do a lot of styling work, uh, both of my own product campaigns and that of others. So this is actually one of my most favorite things about the creative process. Styling a shot, whether it be the layout of materials uh, for a DIY posts, for example, or creating my own lookbooks for my accessories line, or working for clients in a more conventional way with styling. Curating a visual narrative and creating a story is really, really fun to me. So throw in designing and making the props and making the set for this to bring that story to life, it's just like the ultimate rewarding combo. So I love working on projects like that. I enjoy projects where I get to design and bring to life a project from the overarching concept phase right through to the prop making, the styling, and the placement of things. So in my eyes, it's kind of like a graduation of sorts from just being simply the maker, pushing me more into a curatorial realm, which I feel is like a natural next step for me. It's kind of like starting off as a seamstress and then growing to become a fashion designer. So here are some shots from uh, my upcoming DIY craft book. Here's a little plug. It's coming out in October. Uh, it's a DIY piñata book. Uh, it's coming out through Hardy Grant Books. And so for this book, I was really um, able to art direct the entire project, uh, designing it from you know, start to finish and then bringing that vision to life using um, um, working with a photographer and a book designer. And it was just super rewarding. And it really fueled a fire to pursue more work of this nature. So one of the most important things I aim to achieve with my work is authenticity. I like to think that the, the tactile nature of my work allows a kind of link between me as the maker and the viewer, which leads to a more authentic experience overall. But I also uh, want to be creating from an authentic place. So to me, this is more than just that my hand has been on everything that kind of passes through my studio. It also means being as authentic as I can as a creative person. And a lot of this centers around things like transfer, transparency online. So I have a really, really love-hate relationship with social media. I feel like it can be uh, an unreal snapshot of a person's life. So you're kind of only seeing a small slice of what a person's life is actually like. And sometimes I feel a little bit terrible about myself when I'm like scrolling through Instagram because everyone just seems to look so shiny and perfect on the internet. Um, but you know, everyone's really guilty of playing into this to an extent, including myself. So for example, this is a picture of my perfect, amazing studio, which I posted recently on my social media, being like, love my new studio, like, love the light, hashtag blessed. Or maybe, I, hopefully I didn't use hashtag blessed, you can check, it's on my Instagram. Um, but, you know, to be honest with you guys, because we're all friends here, my studio most of the time looks like this. <laughs> But, you know, there's nothing wrong with a little bit of smoke and mirrors, but I do still feel the need to try and be a bit more real in the way that I present myself online. So I guess that means to be a bit more transparent about my day-to-day -day experiences being a creative person. So that means trying to share in little ways the great achievements and the ups, but also be honest about the downs, the mistakes, the failures, and all that kind of stuff. I think being more authentic in this way really helps me to connect in a more real way with my audience. I also really try to be authentic in my connections with others and be an active part of my creative community. So I like to engage with the other creative people regularly and collaborate with them. I like to support others rather than trying to compete with others, and I think that's a really important one. And I try to make friends and not contacts, and these genuine connections lead to a more genuine experience overall. 
I also really think it's important to practice self-care so that I can, this is a bit Oprah, this, this part of my talk, so just bear with me, um, so that I can practice, like, you know, I can be my best self and in turn produce my best work. So I experienced this major case of burnout a couple of years ago, and I was literally crippled as an artist. Like, I couldn't make anything. All I could do all day was just, like, lie on the couch and watch Law & Order. Not to say Law & Order is, like, terrible because I actually love it, but, you know, I wasn't doing anything, so it was kind of shit. Um, it really made me take a closer look at my habits and forced me to be really honest with myself about how I am or am not handling things and what I'm good at and what I need to improve. So through this, I learned to be more comfortable with like those icky aspects of being an artist and to prioritize self-care and allow moments to let my brain and body rest. And so in doing this, I'm providing physical and mental space for myself so that these new ideas can just flood in and so I can sustain this wonderful career that I've found myself in for as long as possible and really see um, where the future takes me. So I guess to close, I feel like as designers, we have a responsibility to share our knowledge and skills with others because that's a huge part of what keeps creativity alive and keeps people really passionate about art. And I think by maintaining a handmade practice um, in my own career, I'm contributing in my own little way to keeping these hands-on methods of making alive so that they don't disappear and that they can still be enjoyed and utilized by people years and years from now. So I just wanted to finish by saying um, thank you so much once again to the Adobe Make It team for having me and to you guys for listening to me ramble on. And if you guys are feeling really inspired after my talk, which I hope you are, um, you may have received some printed collateral when you walked in the room uh, just earlier. So I've teamed up with Moo and we've created this making station at the Adobe uh, Make It Bash tonight. So you can take your cards that you've received, we've got some instructions on them, take them over to the crafting station and create an amazing accessory that I hope you will wear around the whole entire party tonight. So just trying to inject a little bit of craft into this um, and yeah, I like, hope you have fun with that later. So that's it from me. Thank you so much.